The first lesson is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as those for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. In this reading, may we find God's word for us. <laughs> the Gospel is from the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and, and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. In this reading, may we find the Gospel of Christ. To God, we thank you for this day, for this moment, for this reminder that there are hearts all over the world, there are children, there are people all beating at the very same time, that we are connected, that whatever affects one of us directly affects all of us indirectly. We are tied in an inescapable network of mutuality that I can never be what I ought to be until everyone else is who they ought to be. Bless now our time of sharing that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts are acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. And all of the people of God said, Amen. Thank you, Michael, for that. We always enjoy hearing you sing. Have I ever shared with you before that I have always wanted to be in the choir? <clears throat> 
that I always wanted to sing, a solo. <laughs> but no one has ever really been that enthusiastic about encouraging me to join the choir. And certainly I've received no invitations or offers to sing a solo. No, seriously, when I was in junior high school, I auditioned more than once for the school choir. And at the end of the audition, I was told I didn't make it. Can't carry a tune and totally tone deaf, said the music teacher. But I went back the second year, and the same thing happened. Didn't get in, rejected. And guess what? I, I guess I'm a glutton for punishment because I went back the third year. Uh, and this time, the music teacher, same music teacher, Mrs. Thelma Wright, oh, she was a piece of work, I tell you, no, no. <laughs> but, 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 but Mrs. Wright felt pity for me and said, listen, Alvin, it is obvious that you really want to be in this choir. I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you in, but under these conditions, stand on the back row, move your lips, mouth the words, but don't you dare make a sound. <laughs> and under those humiliating terms and conditions, I sang for a season in the school choir. I kid you not. I kid you not. But I tell you, the group I really wanted to be in was the band, the high school marching band. And I got in the band, no problem. The Gentry High School Marching Band. It was the highlight of my high school career, purple and white, the Gentry Rams, and I ended up a Stella in the woodwind section played the alto saxophone, and I could play a mean saxophone once upon a time. But, you know, that wasn't my first choice. I, I made it. I was playing an instrument in the band, played second alto saxophone, but really the position that I really wanted was, uh, was drum major. I wanted to be the drum major. The position that I really wanted, I wanted to be the one out front leading the whole, the whole band. But I never made it as drum major. You had to be agile and high stepping. There were many others who were much better at that than me. But I wanted to ask you this morning, have you ever wanted to be drum major? Have you ever wanted to be the one out front leading the parade? Uh, maybe it wasn't the choir or the band, maybe, but the, maybe there was something you felt a particular calling and giftedness and capacity to do. And you were so excited about doing it, you wanted to be the one out front leading the group, leading the parade, leading the charge, heading the committee. Have you ever wanted to be, have you ever dared to be a drum major. There's a story in the Gospel of Mark about two brothers, two followers of Jesus, who wanted more than anything to be drum majors. As the disciples walked along one day with Jesus, these brothers, disciples, followers of Jesus, said to him, Lord, grant us to sit at your right and your left when you come into the kingdom. Those who sit next to the chief are among those who share power with the chief. In other words, Lord, when you get elected Messiah and your kingdom has come, grant us to be members of your cabinet. We want to be a part of the inner circle. We, we want to be a part of the hierarchy. We, we want to be drum majors in the parade. I have come to this text more than once over the course of the years of my ministry. And more than once, 
I have gotten to this text and I'm ready, and I think with most, to automatically condemn James and John for being selfish and self-centered and self-absorbed. I mean, it is unseemly. It is unbecoming. It is inappropriate. It's unsettling. It's just out of order. It just doesn't set right. It, it, it feels like, it, you know, it looks like it's blatantly arrogant. It, it, it looks like it's a power grab, angling for seats and positions and titles in the kingdom. How dare they be so self-absorbed and make such a self-centered, selfish request. But maybe before we condemn these brothers too quickly, Maybe we ought to take a good look in the mirror at ourselves. I mean, it's just us up in here talking this morning. And maybe as we take a good, long look calmly and honestly at ourselves, we will discover that we too have those same desires for recognition, for importance that the brothers had. Maybe we will discover that we have the same desire for attention, the same desire to be first. Of course, the other disciples got mad with James and John, upset with them, and, and we can understand why. But we must understand that we have some of the same James and John qualities in us. Maybe we really haven't heard this passage unless we can see ourselves in here somewhere. Ernesto uh, Tina Harrow said, if you read the Bible and it doesn't challenge you, then you're reading yourself and not the Bible. Yes, we've got some James and John qualities. There is deep down within all of us a desire, this instinct to be out front this desire to lead the parade, this desire to be first, and it is something that runs the whole gamut of life. So don't be too quick to condemn and put down these brothers. They're just caught up in the human condition. They're just like you and me. We all have a little drum major desire. We all want to be important, want to be recognized, want to get some attention, surpass others to achieve distinction, to lead the parade every now and then. Uh, uh, Alfred Atler, the great uh, psychoanalyst, contends that this is really the dominant human impulse. Sigmund Freud used to contend that sex was the dominant impulse. And Adler came along with a new argument that this quest for recognition, this desire for attention, this desire for distinction is the basic impulse, the basic drive of human life, this drum major desire. We began early to ask life to put us first. Our first cry as a baby was a cry a bid for attention. And all throughout childhood, the drum major impulse or desire is a major obsession. Children ask life to grant them first place. They're little controlling tyrants, a little bundle of ego, and they have innately the drum major instinct. And in adult life, we still have it, and we really never really get by it. We like to do something good, and you know we like to be praised for it. Now if you don't believe that, you just go on living your life. And you'll discover very soon that you, that you like a little praise every now and then. Everybody likes it. It's, it's a matter of fact. You, 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 you want your name called? You want some recognition? Some attention? I know it's maybe even unseemly to even talk about this openly this morning. But that is a basic human instinct. A desire. But somehow... This warm glow we feel when we are praised or when our name is in print is something of a vitamin A to our ego. Nobody's unhappy when they are praised, even if they know they don't really deserve it, even if they don't really believe it. The only unhappy people about praise is when the praise is going too much towards somebody else. 
But everybody likes to be praised because of this real drum major desire. And this is a very understandable request for the disciples to make of Jesus. I've been to this text many times before, but this is the first time I've seen this and approached this text this way. After all, here are the ones, these disciples are the ones who left everything. They left everything to come and follow Jesus, to walk with Jesus along the way. They left houses and lands and families and friends and familiar routines. They left boats and bank accounts. They've given up everything to go with Jesus, to go with Jesus. Why did they commit so much to Jesus? Well, unlike a lot of people, they believed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, the great leader who would come in and raise an army and kick the stuffing out of the Romans, kick the Romans out of Judea, set up Israel again as the most powerful nation in the world. It had not been easy trooping around after Jesus throughout Judea. The request is quite understandable. Lord, when you finally get everything together and win your kingdom, let us sit beside you in ruling your realm. Lord, when you at last bring peace on earth, let that peace first be in my heart in my marriage, in my family, in my home. Lord, when you at last lift up the poor and the outsider and the marginalized and set things right in the world, be sure, Lord, that I'm one of the major beneficiaries. Oh, it's not a bad request. But Jesus replies to this perfectly understandable request by saying, you don't really know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? We know what the disciples did know. We know that what Jesus was talking about walking on this road, that it led to torture and death and to a cross. The cup that Jesus is to drink is the cup of his horrible death. The baptism that will drown him is the baptism of his death as he suffocates to death on a cross. And the disciples showed that they are clueless when they respond, sure, Lord, we can do that. We're able to drink of your cup and be baptized with your baptism, no problem. Yes, we are able, Lord. We're ready to go with you all the way. We often, though, unaware of what we're asking, there's always a price to be paid. There's always a cost involved. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said it many years ago when Christ calls a person, he calls us to come and die. To come and die. One would have thought that Jesus would have condemned these brothers for desiring high seats in the kingdom. One would have thought Jesus would have said, you out of your place, you're selfish. Why would you raise such a question and make a request like this? But this isn't what Jesus said. He did something altogether different. He said in substance, oh, I see what you want is to be first. You want to be great. You want to be important. You want to be significant. Congratulations. You can be. You ought to be. If you're going to be my disciple, you must be. But he reordered their priorities. And he said, don't give up that basic desire that you're born with, that you come into this world with. Don't give it up. It's a good instinct if you use it right. It's a good desire if you don't distort it and pervert it. Don't give it up. Keep feeling the need of being important. Keep feeling the need for being first. But I want you to be first in love. I want you to be first in moral excellence. I want you to be first in generosity. I want you to be first in service. I want you to be first in hospitality, in giving, in making a difference in the world. I want you to be first in building the beloved community of God. That's what I want you to do. Go ahead and be first. 
but just turn it around, be first in love. He transformed the situation by giving a new definition of greatness. And you know how he said it. He said, now listen, sisters and brothers, I can't give you greatness, and really I can't make you first. This is what Jesus said to John. You must, James and John, you must earn it. True greatness comes not by favoritism, but by fitness. And the right hand and the left are not mine to give. They belong to those who are prepared. You're willing to pay the cost. You're willing to go and die. And so Jesus gave us a new definition of greatness. If you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that the one who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. And you know what that means? That means everybody can be great. That's what that means. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. You don't have to have a degree in order to serve. You don't have to know Latin and Greek and Hebrew in order to serve. You don't have to go to seminary in order to serve. Everybody can serve. All you gotta do is have a willing heart and an open mind and being willing to say yes to God, yes to God's word. You know, I, I, we, we, we've been called to be great servants. I spoke yesterday in Baltimore at a uh, group, group of church leaders, the United uh, Church of Christ, the Central Atlantic Conference, and they were meeting in this conference in light of the Black Lives Matter movement in Baltimore and around the nation, asking, what can the church do? What is the church being called to do? In these days of declining church memberships and almost daily gun violence on school campuses and city streets, this day when people of color are being gunned down on city streets and a broken criminal justice system with a disproportionate uh, number of people of color in prison, more people in prison, in this country than any civilized nation in the world, a, a lack of immigration reform, the growing gap between the haves and the have not. What is the still speaking voice of God calling us to do? I, and I try to say to them, and I, and I say to us this morning, I think God might be calling us to be drum majors drum majors for justice and drum majors for love. I think God might be calling us to lead the way. Uh, uh, that, that's our moral imperative. We got a moral imperative to be. We're not just up here occupying space on this corner. God has called us to make a difference. Yes, God has. Our political leaders are not doing it. Business leaders are not doing it. We got too many timid souls and small-minded people playing to the cheap seats. You know, saying what the crowd wants. We need somebody to stand up with some courage and some conviction and lead the way in building the beloved community. Let's lead the parade, sisters and brothers of the park. Let's lead the parade. Let's be drum majors for justice. Drum majors for love. Drum majors for peace. Their last sermon that the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached in the pulpit of the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, before his assassination in Memphis, Tennessee, was a sermon entitled, The Drum Major Instinct. It's from, it was from this text, story of James and John. A sermon that he preached at Mason Temple the night before his assassination, I've been to the mountaintop, is better known than this sermon. But this is a sermon he preached two months before his assassination in Memphis. Excerpts of it were played at his funeral by request of his wife, Coretta. I close this little word this morning with some words from that sermon by Dr. King. 
Every now and then, I guess we all think realistically about the day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something we call death. We all think about it. And every now and then I think about my own death. And I think about my own funeral. And I don't think about it in a morbid sense. Every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And I leave this word to you this morning. If you're around when I've met my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. Every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like for somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that day that I tried to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say that day that I tried to in my life to clothe those who are naked. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to be able to say that day that I tried to love humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I, I won't have the fine, luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I want to leave a committed life behind. That's all I want you to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or a song, if I can show somebody she's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian on, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message the Master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your left or on your left, on your right side but not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right or your left side, not in terms of a political kingdom or ambition, but I want to be there in love, in justice, in truth, in commitment to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. May it be. May it be. May it be. May it be.